Um, welcome everyone, everyone to this panel. Uh, as Michael introduced me, I'm Lucas Brook. I'm with McMaster University and I lead the studies in the driving simulation lab there. I'll be your moderator today. Before we start, I just would like to thank VI Grade for organizing this event and promoting such a relevant topic. Um, the foresight that VI Grade had in capturing this movement in the industry is really commendable. Uh, and I believe all the panelists here would agree with me that we were craving for it, honestly. So today with me, I have top-notch specialists in driving simulation, vehicle dynamics, and automotive testing. Mr. Francisco Colado Sevilla, lead engineer in vehicle modeling at Rivian. Peter Gibbons, technical director of vehicle dynamics at Multimatic. Claudio Anicarico, CEO of Mechanic 42. Anish Anthony, VP of product management at Concurrent Real Time. And Alessandro Baldari, VI Grades, Harder in the loop sales manager for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. I know we have Christoph Ortman as well for the QA. Uh, thank you everybody for joining and let's get this started. Um, I would like to ask a question first to Claudio. Um, Claudio, you are the founder and CEO of Mechanica Quarenta Do, a company that um, provides tools and methods for the automotive industry. And you also cooperate directly with the Department of Mechanics and Industrial Technologies of the University of Florence, where you're a professor and a member of the scientific staff. So you have one foot in industry and another foot in academia, so to speak, which gives you a broad perspective. That's why I'm starting with you. So my question to you is, why do you think hardware in the loop is becoming so important these days? Thank you, Lucas, for your kind question. Um, yes, I think that in the past, uh, the vehicles were seen as a, a list of components. These components were pretty um, distant with each other because uh, the, you, you, you were focusing just on the performance on the single component, but then the integration was not so important. Today, today the, the vehicles are more uh, a list of functions more than components, and these functions are always distributed be between different uh, components. So some part of the function comes from different parts, different sensors and different actuators. And so the, the focus is not anymore on the single performance of the component, but it is on the interaction between uh, uh, signals and measurements and uh, actuations. This is the reason why I think that today uh, having a not during the loop scenario, having a driving simulator, or in any case, having a virtual vehicle in your facility is something fundamental for improving the efficiency of the whole vehicle and the whole functions that the vehicle has embedded. For example, it is uh, today possible to think about uh, ADAS functionalities, which involve a lot of sensors inside the car, a lot of sensors that are looking outside the car, without uh, having something that it is properly coordinating with each other, even with the actuators and so on. And uh, so, in my opinion, the virtual vehicle becomes the, the language that it is transversal to the whole departments of, the, of an OEM, but it is also, can, can be also given outside the OEM. So it is something that can be used to coordinate every actor, every, every stakeholder of the whole de development process. So having uh, this language, the virtual vehicle language, enables a lot of testing that can be done not only anymore at the single test bench or uh, on the road, but can be something like, let me say, fuzzy between the virtual scenarios and the real scenarios. And so with the same model, you can test, for example, the steering system, the brake system, the radars, cameras, and so on, and check where is the very most important part of the coordination between the, this part. Coordination for me is uh, the, the keyword, uh, mo the most important keyword in hardware in the loop uh, technology. And uh, even talking about ADAS, um, one thing that I always have in mind is that ADAS needs uh, uh, to be in the wild. So you cannot check them just in a, a closed circuit. And you need to go in the wild, in the park break roads and so on. But this means that if, if you want to repeat the same scenario uh, several times, 
you, you, you have to waste a lot of time and the scenario will not be the same. But if you have uh, some hardware in the loop technology, you, you can check all the components that mm, are uh, uh, building up your ADAS functionalities in the same scenario as many times as you want without moving a step from your laboratory. So this is for me very, very important in, the, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, technology. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And one of the things that you said that really resonates with me is that the vehicle is becoming less a list of components and becoming more a list of functions, right? And that shows the importance of putting the driver or the and the passengers at the center of the design. If it wasn't for that, we would just do hardware in the loop. But the reason why we're bringing hardware in the loop and driver in the loop is that we value the, the aspect of the feeling, the aspect of how the driver interacts with with such systems, right? Um, and and that that is that is very um, that's very important trend that we're seeing. So one of the things that you mentioned to me earlier was how we need a specific test benches, right? And how um, uh, how those test benches play in in the development of the vehicle. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. You touch at the, the critical point uh, because uh, the driver is uh, in the center of the functions. So today the vehicles are also communicating with the driver with different uh, words, different meaning of, of communication. For example, think about a lane keeping uh, uh, system that it is communicating something to the driver just with vibrations or sound and so on. And uh, this is also introducing different feelings for uh, the, the driver or the occupants of the vehicle. And so it is impossible to um, figure out what it is the global experience of the driver into the vehicle without testing it in a very extensive way. Uh, and this is why I think that the position of a specific test bench around, all around the, the driving simulator is uh, crucial. For example, the steering feeling is, some, is something that it is uh, very difficult to, to, to reproduce in a very precise way. So putting a test bench with uh, some uh, real components, so uh, not only providing just the electrical signals that, uh, that are produced by the, 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 the steering gear, but also exerting the, the forces that are acting on the steering gear while driving. It is important to have the correct feeling, for example, the vibration and the influence of the vibration while driving uh, towards the, the driver himself. And in the same way, uh, also the brakes or uh, the radar are important for as they are interac interacting with each other but uh, you need some specific test bench to, to avoid uh, too much uh, modeling inside these particular things. For example, think about the brakes. The brakes has a lot of dynamics inside them. And if uh, uh, the, the, the development process of uh, the brakes is uh, uh, mostly focused on the modeling of the brake itself, uh, the uh, parametrization phase of this uh, modeling can be as long as the whole development phase of the break itself. So having a specific test bench can help in uh, speeding up all the development process and uh, check in a very easy way uh, the, the, the effect of every single component that, that you put in your system. A typical, typical example is the feedback that you have today under the feet when you have a brake by wire system and uh, changing the feedback is very, very important in, uh, in a driver in the loop uh, simulation and having also the hardware in the loop put it in a very easy way and uh, um, permit to the engineers to focus on their task and to focus on the development without wasting too much time and wasting too much money. Yeah, and one of the things that you mentioned as well as ADAS, right? And I'm going to bring a niche to, to this discussion uh, because we've been talking about test benches and test benches, and, and I know Anish has a special place in his heart for, for ADAS. So Anish, you've been with Concurrent for more than 10 years. 
Now you're leading product and marketing direction, but you also worked as chief technical architect for FPGA Workbench. So this came very into handy when you're developing this, this hardening the loop solution. Um, and you told me that you like to work on software as much as you like to work on hardware. So maybe thanks to that, we have all those cool, sto cool toys from VI Grid and Concurrent now. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about how you think hardware in the loop simulation uh, together with driver in the loop can provide a safe platform for, for ADIS testing and artificial intelligence algorithms? Yeah, thanks Lucas for that introduction. Um, you know, like Lucas mentioned, I like software as much as I like hardware. So it 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 brings all of that together uh, because ADAS functionality uh, in hardware in the loop is a combination of that essentially. And what is the goal of ADAS? ADAS, uh, an ADAS system, the goal is to automate driving as much as possible in different conditions and situations right and in theory as we move towards a fully autonomous system the control system with the sensors and actuators must be able to deal with an endless array of scenarios and testing these endless array of scenarios becomes a daunting and challenging task right so testing a complex system like a modern vehicle on a test track or a real uh, road involves complex and co costly engineering and not only costly engineering and testing but also uh, testing it in a real road environment is an even riskier challenges because uh, you don't know how the algorithm behaves you know i can't take the algorithm directly and put it on the road uh, because i'm driving with other cars other people uh, putting the driver in risk right so to reach this road test stage the vehicle must be fully or nearly functional and this this limits the testing opportunity to a very late stage in the development process uh, which what does it mean in turn it implies higher engineering costs uh, moreover because the real test conditions and the timing is very constrained uh, the test coverage is never complete uh, only a small subset of real world conditions can be tested in the time frame you know, so typically on the software side, what we do is test early, test often, and test everything that's appropriate not only in the software development lifecycle, but it is also important for the hardware development and integration uh, cycle and integration of the software and the hardware together. Like Claudia mentioned, you know, there is a combination there which needs to be tested. And thus having these virtual test benches enable faster and less expensive test and they provide better coverage okay so so when we come to model based design and zero prototype approach to system design uh, uh, the primary step is typically in model based design is to virtualize these vehicle software and hardware systems right so you are taking the software components and hardware components and virtualizing them means you are creating models of them and simulating them and verifying this uh, so that that pretty much tends to fall in into uh, model in the loop or software in the loop development. So this lays the foundation of these testings, and at this stage, the simulation uh, of virtual models, not only of the software functionality but also of the hardware components, including we are modeling sensors and actuators and ECUs, uh, virtual ECUs, and other controllers. So the hardware components themselves are becoming, you know, software and virtual. OK, so now we are after we finish that stage, which is, you know, software in the loop, model in the loop, software in the loop. Uh, the next stage is to, you know, slowly bring real hardware, real sensors, real actuators and real controllers into the loop. And that's that's where, uh, you know, there is a union of the software and hardware pieces together. And at this stage, we are not only validating these real hardware components, but we are also validating the models that we created, right? In the first stage, we created models of these components. Now we are having these real components and we are validating these real components. Uh, and that is really important. You know, we cannot miss the fact that 
Uh, in the first stage, we had software models. And now in the second, third stage, we are validating these models. So next time when we come around, we trust our software models. You know, we trust our software models in the virtual environment uh, to qualify uh, whatever we are doing, you know, be it an ADAS system, be it the entire vehicle, right? Uh, and these test benches like cell, hill, uh, cell, mill, and hill, uh, they provide a safe and uh, repeatable and reliable way for software and hardware testing under various operating conditions, right? We are not putting a lot of people on the street on risk. We are not putting the driver on risk. We are providing a safe environment where we can test these scenarios uh, repeatedly as we go along. OK, next step is, you know, like uh, Lucas said, I like FPGAs and uh, CUDA and GPU. Uh, AI is becoming a big part of this conversation. You know, classical model control, classical and modern control systems are typically optimized around certain operating conditions. But uh, like I said, we have to test endless scenarios for ADAS uh, for autonomous vehicles. Uh, thus, AI is becoming an integral part not only for creating these different scenarios, different sensor, sensor models and different functionality, but also to train and to navigate these scenarios safely. Right. So, so when you come to a hill bench, okay, hill test bench is really important. It provides you the safety and the reliability and the repeatability, but it also lays the foundation uh, to incorporate the evolving landscape for testing ADAS functionality. As we move along, every day we are seeing new sensors coming into the marketplace, new cameras, new lidars, new radars. Uh, uh, new, you know, neural networks, uh, new ASICs, new FPGAs, uh, and how do we incorporate that into the next generation of the vehicle to come to a stage where we can uh, safely test this, okay, uh, and put it all together uh, in a hill environment, and from there, the next stage is to take it into a driver in the loop, because the hill is not enough, you know, the ADAS system has to have an interaction with the human, and that is where the human in the loop or the driver in the loop uh, comes into picture. And uh, once we have that uh, testing, we have a lot of, I wouldn't say 100% coverage uh, on the code and the hardware, on the software and the hardware, but we, we are pretty much there. Uh, before we take that and put it on the street and then we can uh, be rest assured that it is not going to be detrimental to the testing of that uh, real prototype that we have it on the street. Yeah. yeah, and I was about to ask you a little bit to get a little bit more technical about the FPGAs and GPUs, but I, it just occurred to me uh, uh, maybe a tricky question for you. So as we move to autonomous systems and to more autonomy, uh, do you see a reduction in the importance of driver in the loop testing? Uh, you know, we can never replace a physical human in the loop. You know, a, a, we can put AI for everything, but again, AI uh, cannot replace a real human. I think we are like 50, 60 years beyond that. The iRobot, right? Uh, we cannot, at least at this stage, we cannot replace the human. We need the driver. Uh, and uh, a driver that goes through different conditions. You do not know how a driver is going to react. And you can write algorithms after algorithms to try to mimic that. And you can have neural networks uh, try to mimic that. And, and that does give a lot of coverage. Don't get me wrong that AI or the AI driver in the loop, what I call. You have a physical driver, but you can create an AI driver uh, that can go through different driving scenarios, but that cannot still give you complete code coverage or give you uh, a reliability saying, what does a real human do? Uh, because there is a lot of emotions involved when a human is driving a car. And I'll, I'll build upon that. Even, even when we reach that 50 years from now, there still be people inside the car, right? Because we're trying to move people from point A to point B anyways. Right. So you still, maybe you move from driver in the loop to passenger in the loop, but you still need to account for that person's perception. Yeah. Right? So that that was why I, I 
I call it a, a tricky question anyways, but I wanted your take on it. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to move this to Francisco because um, I want the OEM perspective that he brings to this to this discussion. Um, Fran, I'm going to call you Fran because you will all be to yep, do that. That's fine. So Fran, you have experience in powertrain and vehicle dynamics, which I identify with, and, and you are um, representing the automakers here. So I want from you the OEM perspective. How do you see hardware in the loop and driver in the loop accelerating electrification um, in, in the industry? So as Claudio and he said, one of the keywords that um, shield plus deal give us. So when we connect a real part with simulation is repeatability. But the other one is uh, to be able to tune your systems or to tune your scenario in a really, really quick way. So as an example, a change of mass or a change on the um, grip of the asphalt, you can do it basically virtually in one click. So when you have that capacity to do 20, 30 iterations of the model and the test uh, per day, that becomes really, really powerful. And um, when we couple that with Hill, and if we think in, in Hill, as uh, Anish was saying, you you have a meal, you have the, the hardware part. So you have your control logic and your plan logic, or your plan logic, sorry, uh, being on Hill in different combinations that allows you to test on really early time your ECU logic or maybe some part that you want to adapt some logic to to that uh, rig. Um, one of the key things that Claudio I think touched on the on the um, different systems, putting them in the loop like steering and brake, that becomes really, really powerful when you go into the deal. And uh, I think we need to think about that as well as uh, what a deal can enable us to do with those parts. So we, we have to be able to put the bricks on the steering in the loop, but also the hardware of the driver in the loop system has to allow us to represent that with uh, good fidelity. So uh, an active pedal system, for example, or a good um, electrical system that you want to, electrical steering system that you want to connect to your grid onto the driver in the loop, sorry, uh, from the hill, depending on what you're simulating. That's a really key thing that you need to, to consider to accelerate and uh, get the correct um, feeling on the deal. And if we think about that on from the development point of view, uh, it allows you to uh, test your concept really early. And your concept could be something, something new, or I think when it becomes really, really key, when you want to reduce parts for a derivative model, it allows you to put that ECU, that real ECU, or that real steering system, or powertrain, or ADAS logic, uh, along with that uh, virtualized new concept or new derivative. And that makes it really, really powerful because virtually you are saving one, one, one million card, right? One prototype. So you are able to do repeatability, uh, do tests much faster save uh, real meals or real prototypes, which becomes really key on, on cutting down the, the cost. And also another point that Claudio touched is when you put everything together. So for example, your steering system plus uh, ADAS cameras in order to uh, evaluate both how do they work together with the driver. Is that sensor function that, that or system fusion that then uh, makes the deal plus heal much, much powerful. So effectively, you can do a much, much uh, more work at the beginning and uh, save a lot of time on debugging problems or understanding how to connect or how to talk between uh, both functionalities. Um, and it's, yeah, it becomes really powerful. And the more we use it, the more we understand it, the more and more we see that we can do uh, things on it, basically. Yeah, I think the, the first, I'm. Um... I'm younger than that, but I think the first big challenge that automotive industry faced about integration and, and systems that are interconnected was probably with stability control systems. I worked with stability control systems before, and it's a great example of how you need everybody working together. It, you just don't you just don't design or calibrate a stability control system with just the brakes or with just the powertrain. You need everything working together, the suspension steering. And then 
when we move towards um, ADAS and you said it right, just right, it's the same and you move towards electrification now where the powertrain system is connected to all other systems, whether if it's the steering or the brakes or everything. Um, again, what, what Claudio said in the beginning is so true. It became not a list of, of components, but a list of functions. So, um, and you, you touch a good point. So we, we speak about zero prototypes, which is bold, I must say, um, but zero mules, that is something that I, I can, I can agree with, you know, uh, and, and rest my conscience, um, well. So do, do you think we are reaching zero mules? I, I would say faster than expected looking for zero prototypes. Yeah, so in terms of mules, how I see it is um, uh, typically uh, uh, the, the word that I know on the mules is that you use a mule to uh, test uh, your, uh, let's say, concept on, I don't know, the powertrain or the suspension or whatever you want to to put on an early mule uh, that you don't have because you don't have any, any prototype, of course. So if you think about it, you can do that in the virtual in the virtual world. You could uh, one option could be you um, create a virtual model of the uh, benchmark model that you want to use, and then you can embed you can embed or you can connect in that model that is correlated um, objectively and subjectively. You can put the model of your uh, powertrain system, for example. So why not? Yes, why not? All, also, um, another easy example uh, on the mules is if you want to understand what concept you are developing, typically where you start is your tire model, your map, like the steering ratio, for example. So you can also do that in the in the, in the virtual world. Um, uh, I know uh, from the past some, some OEMs that I was pairing with, uh, we have gone through, through that uh, path. On, on trying to develop an early meal purely on the on the VA grade uh, rig. So defining wheel base, track with these tire models, um, string wrap ratios, and that was fed into the into the supplier of what we wanted on those um, early vehicles. Yeah, you glitched for a fraction of a second, but we we were able to understand everything that you said. Um, and yeah, the fact is we don't always have the whole vehicle, and that that is a that is a problem, uh, not a problem, but something to overcome with with hill and and then with driver in the loop as well. Um, so I'm gonna ask Peter. Uh, Peter, um, I'm gonna bring you here so you add a little bit of motorsport perspective to this. We talked we talked from let's say an academia slash industry point of view. Then uh, Anish and, and Francisco gave us a good overview about um, the OEM perspective and where the market is going. So Moodymatic is an undisputed leader in automotive design, especially vehicle dynamics, and it has its tentacles pretty much everywhere. Now, what is your perspective on, on this topic, hardware in the loop and driver in the loop, and how does that change the game, especially for motorsport in your perspective? Uh, thanks, it's a good question. Um, for us, Multimatic, we started to embrace um, full driver in the loop about 14 years ago with our association with um, Diego Minan at uh, VI Grade. At that point, there were many doubters um, that there's a, this was actually possible. Um, and luckily, through the, our CTO, Larry Holt, and our Vice President of Engineering, Michael Gatilla, we were able to forge forward. Um, there, there were probably only two people within Multimatic other than uh, uh, myself that really thought we could do this. So for us, uh, driver and loop totally transformed our vehicle dynamics approach. It brought us uh, light years ahead in, uh, in our modeling. Uh, we thought we had very high fidelity models um, and, and offline, a lot of the vehicle response looked very good. And then the second you bring the human in the loop, um, it all crashes. You realize a lot of your subsystems are just, um, just horrible to be quite frank. So um, you know, we've, we spent the last many years um, evolving our driver in the loop um, techniques. And of course, the, the, um, the simulators have come light years. We're running the DIL 250, DIM 250 and Novi now, and that's totally um, changed our approach. We can do 
um, primary ride and obviously starting work on secondary ride. So not only can you do um, limit handling, which was really our sort of the focus, our focus in the beginning, but now start to look at the OEM or OEMs world, which is um, extremely important, especially as we go into zero prototype, the zero prototype approach. So again, inevitably, as you as you start um, evolving the process, you start realizing the limitations of of, of your models, your so the code simulation, the um, the software in the loop, and you realize you need to start to bring in the hardware in the loop. Specifically, I think things like um, MR damping, um, you know, to actually predict the hysteretic effects and the latencies and in, uh, involved in in a MR damper or in the steering systems. It's even impossible to get steering system algorithms, I think, from suppliers. So you have to bring hardware in the loop and, and the same on braking. So it's just a natural evolution, I think, in, in um, improving the, the fidelity of the of the approach, which as you start to zone in on a zero prototype, you have to have that level of fidelity. Um, if you if you miss anything, it could be somewhat catastrophic in, in any of your subsystems. So that's really where we are. Um, for us, we, we're starting to build a lot of our own controllers for our active damping and um, things like that, adaptive and active damping. So for us, our first foray into it really with concurrent is um, is in the ECU um, world, and um, it allows us to do um, sort of uh, understand any of the the issues, the latencies of communication, and then also all the way to the functional safety. Right, functional safety becomes a big part of it, and um, I think you guys have sort of covered all that before, but. Um, it opens up a whole new world for far more efficient approach to the functional safety issues as well that comes with a controller. That's really where we are. And the motorsports world, you know, it's it's interesting. Motorsports is so constrained. Um, you don't have many of the active uh, systems that we're lucky enough to be able to have in, in the real world or in OEM. So um, to be honest, hardware and loop is probably um, uh, the, the ECUs, absolutely, but you know a lot of the other hardware that you can do pretty decent software in the loop models of many of the other components. I think for uh, for motorsports, uh, so our focus really in hardware and loop is more um, in the OEMs than in, in motorsports. But it, it, naturally, you're always striving to improve the fidelity. So um, as we as we identify the need for some some uh, specific uh, component level. Um, um, replication will, will start going hardware and loop, but you know the the racing driver is not too worried about the brakes or the brake feel or the steering feel. He just wants the, he's just at the limit, so it kind of tends to focus your refocus where you look at hardware in the loop in the motorsports versus uh, OEMs. But both are are, are critical, probably for slightly, slightly different component level um, approaches. Yeah, no, I see your point here, and 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 it's. And it's a fair point, I must say. That's something that that didn't occur to me, and it, and it should, because of course, uh, when you're when you're driving to the limit, you're more worried about how, where you can reach rather than how does it, well, not how does it feel, but um, the process to it. And it's interesting to see or to hear that um, you can get very good and accurate models for for motorsport, and that's that's something that that opens uh, a lot of ideas in my head. But one of the things that you said that resonated with me is how hardware in the loop can be attached to the design process, sort of to mitigate the limitation of the model that you that you have, but that you need to be in a, in a higher level state, right? Um, in case you have that part of the component or or that system. So, can you can you talk just a little bit more about that, and and maybe if you can give us examples, that would be great as well. I'm sorry, um, I sort of missed um, uh, sort of expand on on what what part of hardware in the loop. Um, so you, sorry. you sure, yeah, you mentioned that how hardware in the loop can mitigate the the lack of accuracy of a specific model right. and efficiency. Yep. Um, I think on in our world, the the damper, the MR damper is probably the the cleanest example of really having to run hardware in the loop. If you want, if you want really accurate vehicle dynamics um, response, um, if you are, if you are, do have that sort of sub subsystem in, uh, in your vehicle, I don't think I think it's extremely difficult. Um, you know, uh, uh, then uh, even though I minimize it in motorsports, obviously as hybrid um, becomes more and more important, I think you know the hybrid technology and representing the hybrid unit in, in hardware in the loop is probably the only way of doing it. Uh, 
um, doing it accurately in the same. Uh, and then again to the ECUs to breaking break by wire. Um, you know, while the motorsports guys are break by wire, you have to have a very, very accurate representation of that um, all the way down to the break break subsystem, right? So the again, their hardware in the loop becomes critical. So not to minimize the motorsport approach, but again, as the fidelity, as you strive for a higher, higher fidelity, where you basically can with complete confidence go from the dill uh, or dim to the to the real world, you need to have just again complete confidence in all subsystems. So, um, but for us, I think from a from a um, for ultimate performance grip level, and uh, basically um, being able to predict the grip of a car, or the limit handling, um, the active damping, adaptive damping is probably something you you really have to have a hardware in the loop. I mean, you know, we're working with um, Claudio and his team, Mechanica team, uh, and the Ad4 group on. Uh, Having perhaps that that um, that hardware in the loop remote, you know, to have to have a full bank of, of hardware uh, running in your um, in our um, environment in, in in our facility is at times probably either impossible economically or constraining just from a physical standpoint. So we're also starting to look at uh, bringing hardware in the loop, but the hardware in the loop is actually remote, um, and and that's that's I think for us one a, a big a big. Uh, step forward because it makes it actually feasible um, economically and uh, physically. So that's another, I think, interesting aspect of all, all this, you know, bringing hardware in the loop on, on the larger items, just steering um, and uh, damping and um, the uh, the powertrain, you, you, you probably physically can't have that um, all on one in, on site. So having it remote is a um, a big step forward as well, and I think there's some a lot of techniques being evolved to to uh, to do that. Uh, again, Mechanica, the uh, Ad4 guys are, are I think um, forging some very interesting approaches there that for sure are, are feasible. Yeah, and one of the things that we we haven't discussed much, but but just occurred to me is how the supplier uh, integration can be done, like let's say easily with. Um, isolated test benches or, or, or workplaces, right? Because one of the things that I've struggled in the past is how to put everybody in the room or in a test track and make them work together. And, and especially when you need a specific weather conditions like winter test and, and all that. So yeah, that's definitely something that would mitigate that, that problem as well. Um, so I'm gonna move to Alessandro now, Alessandro Baldari. He is the hardware in the loop sales manager with VI grade for the EMEA market. And well, from Alessandro, from what these previous gentlemen said, there is a strong need for both uh, industry, academia to in interconnect equipment and create this um, multimodal testing methodology, right? Which is aligned driving simulation with hardware. So can you share with us um, a little bit about AutoHawk and the uh, Hill solution that VI Grade is currently promoting. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Thank you, and thank you everybody for the great introduction you made uh, and uh, the great speech. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, some uh, examples and especially what uh, what we are doing right now in uh, VI Grade. So uh, we listen to our customer. We listen to our key partners like you guys and. Uh, what we came out is uh, using our technology, using the partnership uh, with the concurrent, and uh, we sorted out a product that should be a, an enabler and a facilitating platform for connecting uh, simulators to hardware in the loop environment and also and so far. So we introduced uh, Howtalk. Howtalk is the VA grade hardware in the loop solution powered by concurrent real time hardware and software at the same time for automotive application. It's a consist uh, basically of uh, real-time hardware, a real-time operating system, Redoc, and real-time software, the same, um, and the IO cars, boards with communicate with all sorts of protocols in the automotive industry that can also integrate a third-party software that can be installed on the, on, uh, on the same machine or communicate through uh, different protocols um, in uh, in combination with the Outlook system. At the same time, do uh, it runs on the Linux base, so it's a very comprehensive, very open platform. And 
at the end, it's a, a flexible hardware in the loop platform that can be used across the entire product development cycle from concept to sign off. We identify the three main application area, three main clusters, the chassis applications with the all vehicle dynamic related problems and, uh, and the hardware in the loop components. When we mean hardware in the loop for us is not simply connecting ECUs, but as Claudio explained, also other participants, uh, Francisco um, and Peter Hennish, it's also connecting the physical, so it's a mechanical hardware in the loop connected in remote or direct to the, the driving simulator through this uh, enabler platform. We have a HADAS system as well, and in the HADAS is not simply the radars, the cameras, the sensor outside the vehicle, but also how the HADAS communicate with the driver. So it's very important also the user experience, the user interface, not only HMIs, but also haptic sensors, um, um, noise and uh, vibrations that in uh, the driver iterate, uh, interact with, with, the, with the vehicles during the, during the driving mode and also powertrain and driveline system with the internal combustion engine, driveline, e-motors, inverter, e-axle, batteries, communication with VMS, and also uh, subsystems. The auto uh, uh, itself is a platform, as I said before, that should be used theoretically and practically uh, alongside the V-cycle development from all different environments. It should be a common platform to develop uh, um, the final vehicle and achieving a zero prototype goal. Can start from desktop application, where we where it's a offline mode, they can run even faster than real time on a real time communicate connecting to model in the loop of soft in the loop mode. In lab connected to test systems. So test, I want to say test rig like a bench, uh, test benches for internal combustion engine or transmission or full vehicle. On sim means on the driving simulator, and then we have the driver in the loop connected to model in the loop, software and hardware in the loop. On the vehicle, that is uh, something that can be achieved right now with the current technology, means that we can install how to talk, very compact how to talk in the vehicle to run a hardware in the loop application where we have the virtual vehicle model that runs and communicate with the controllers on the vehicle. So it means on the first mules, on the on the real roads, and then finally the dig digital twin, a complete digital vehicle that talk and exchange and anticipate information with the, the real vehicle. In order to do that, we introduce a three different uh, base uh, configurations. Uh, this auto code 8, 16 and 24, depending on the number of cores and depending also on the, you know, the main application areas. Um, this, all these comes with uh, uh, multi-core technology, radar operating system, um, different memory size, and uh, of course, a CAN, CANFD and LEAN communication protocols um, and boards. And then uh, all of this system can be expanded uh, with uh, fault insertion, uh, injection, uh, and also power supply system. And the same time also can be expandable with the multiple cars for uh, digital analog uh, IOs and so on. And then we also have a desktop solution that is a combination of uh, it's a Linux based, but it's a Windows. So we combine in the same machine, in a very powerful machine, thanks to KVM RT technology. Um, the RT system, so real time system within a Windows PC in a single machine, when we, we can run on this system, a different operating system, thanks to the virtual machine. This is a uh, see two main uh, core applications is a software in the loop, hardware in the loop, and modern in the loop, um, let's say early application at the desktop of the engineer, or also as a preparation workplace to support the simulation simulators. What is inside? How talk? As I say, it's a platform. It's a platform made by hardware where we have the concurrent uh, hardware system, including also boards. Uh, IO, FAPGA, CAN, HeterCAT, HeterNet, Lean, you name it. Uh, signal conditioning and fault insertion that can be uh, included in the system. We have the software uh, suite 
from VI grade, the VI drive sim, uh, including carrier time for a vehicle dynamic model. This is the core of the technology of a VI, VI grade. The environment and the traffic and sensor modeling system, the visualization world is the world sim, and also can be connected to external software through software in the loop or FMUs to third party softwares. What is in between uh, is the simulation workbench. There is a very important uh, layer uh, backbone that manage the real time and synchronization between uh, all the systems connected, uh, all the hardware connecting and the softwares connecting. The testing automation can be used by um, scripting or connecting existing test automation from third parties. And this allow to connect the device unit under test or simply ECUs and simulators. It is uh, our core business and real vehicle as well. There's a simulation workbench that is a uh, uh, I can show you here is a, uh, in a single slide the workflow in Workbench where we have a real time database when it includes the scripts, uh, the user mount models, uh, the MATLAB uh, Simulink interface and uh, data structures, the programming part, uh, the testing and the monitoring. What is also very important is uh, as same as our simulators, we are totally open system. So we, and this is a platform at the same time. So we are an ecosystem that can be everything, including a VI grade software, hardware, and concurrent hardware as well. But also we are open to third party softwares, not only in communication through FMUs, but all open API, but also we can run this third party software installed on the Outlook at the same time. And also we are open to talk with external um, hardware in the loop system existing at the customer side. Conclusion, hardware in the loop application, uh, how talk is, a, uh, is the perfect machine and platform for hardware in the loop application. It's a complement offline for driving simulator activity, but also um, in, in laboratory for achieving virtual sign off. More complex uh, use cases demand for high performance, as we discussed today, and so it's a requirement for open and expandable hardware in the loop solution that is can be expandable depending on the, what is linked to the driving simulator. It's a Linux based uh, open architecture that enable integration of a custom solution as well as third party products and we agree together together with the concurrent real time as launch how to talk the complete and open solution made of hardware, software, and integrated services. I also would like to take the opportunity to announce that in the coming days, there will be the release of uh, also a white paper that we uh, we wrote it uh, via grade to uh, this title is a discover how combining hardware in the loop, software in the loop, and model in the loop testing with the driving simulator technology accelerate getting the zero prototype. This will uh, be distributed uh, per email uh, to the VA grade mailing list. And of course, you just need to write and subscribe to, to get the, the white paper. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. And I have a question for you. But first, I must say that if you have a question, please send us a question in the in the Q&A section. I forgot to, to mention that in the beginning for which I, I apologize. Um, but Alessandro, one of the things that come to my mind here is um, I work in a in a big facility with a lot of different equipment for vehicle testing. And one of my concerns would be how modular AutoHawk would be to enable me to connect the simulator that we have first with one piece of hardware and then to another piece of hardware, or maybe to two different pieces of hardware. For example, we have a, a bat battery cell um tester and we have the powertrain tester right so ideally i would have those two equipments connected to my driver in the loop uh, setup so can you talk just a little bit more about mm -hmm. the modularity that you guys planned yeah yeah thank you thank you lucas for the question um as explaining during the slides uh, the idea is to use a how talk as a connecting hub and also at the same time to share the same vehicle model between different department, departments between a different uh, hardwares that i mean a physical testing room testing equipment that can communicate with the same vehicle model that runs in real time that is also very very important topic running in the hard real time is the key also when you connect the, the simulation world to a simulator where is the driver behind the steering wheel. 
And uh, AutoAuk, thanks to his uh, powerful hardware, but at the same time a powerful pro operating system because it's Linux based, you can guarantee the respect of the hard real time connection. And uh, thanks to also to VA grade uh, um, vehicle dynamic model, there's a VI car real time, we can also have uh, this uh, flexibility to introduce uh, sub models the model by, I don't know, Simulink, you name it, or other software that can communicate, or hardware, real hardware, that can communicate to the vehicle dynamic model. Thank you. And I do have some questions from, from the audience here um, that I believe are mainly for or about AutoHawk. So one of them says, supplier software in the loop models pre-compiled as Windows as functions need to be integrated for CAN REST bus simulation. How can we best integrate them? We have a Christoph here. This is the mega expert of. Uh... <laughs> I know, I know. That <laughs> is our cue, Christoph. Don't, don't raise the expectation. First of all, <laughs> uh, hello to everybody. I make it real quick. So taking existing S functions, you can integrate directly on the sim workbench level on a, on a particular um, uh, as a particular module basically or model and then you can assign it to a certain cpu and these kind of things are all within uh, possible within um some workbench and what is essential really here is by doing that you expose all possible communication variables that you want to have on the so-called real-time database um, that i would consider basic something like a virtual bus system that any other component may be a hard um, a real test bench somewhere or maybe another module in the software, they can all access data signals through that signal, through that real time database that is at the core of everything in the end. And that allows you to push data into it, take data out. And that is done in a, in a synchronized deterministic fashion. So I hope that answered that question. <laughs> yeah, and another question was, how do you see the possibility to use unified FMI for hill testing within different software? How model-based development will help with it? Um, within different software, I, I interpret this now a little bit, your question. So it sounds to me like the so-called uh, FMU, which is the FMI is only the interface, but the FMU is the functional mockup unit is actually authored in different software packages. So the source of that functional mockup unit is coming from different authoring tools like Daimola or you name them out there. All of that can be integrated also again on the sim workbench level as there's a generic FMI interface, uh, FMU uh, in integration support available. And then in that case, again, just like the S function I talked about before an FMU becomes available um to stuff all their data into the real-time database and then any other fmu can talk directly to another fmu or to existing for example make a model such as vi car real time and in that case you would say that's a perfect platform to support model-based engineering or model-based development and that can be a combination of anything from handwritten C models to FMUs coming from a third party uh, authoring tool all the way to um, S functional functionality being modeled inside of MATLAB Simulink, for example. Yeah, and maybe we have time for one more question that I can see here in the chat. Can you give more details about your offline and DOE simulations, please? about DOE, design of experiment, is that the question? I think so, yes. Yeah. So about that and offline simulation. Right, there's several layers to that. One is inside of our VRK real-time uh, platform, uh, we have, when running uh, maneuvers, we have capabilities included that allow you to vary vehicle parameters in uh, utilizing DOE techniques. So that's one layer for, typical layer that is used for offline. However, in many project works, it has also turned out to be beneficial to use third party um, tools in order to design your experiment. What frontier comes to mind or using MATLAB or math works based techniques in order to come up with a experiment matrix. Um, 
that are integrated are certainly the ones that we have in car real time directly. And that is what we typically would do then to run an entire campaign where uh, you can vary things like, I make a simple example, a spring rate, for example, in the vehicle, something like that, for instance, and run entire campaigns. Um, of course, you can then also, uh, if you include it, make that a global parameter and make that a possible variable or factor in your design of experiments. So there are several techniques available to do, to support that offline as well. Thank you, Christoph. And with that, I will thank all of the panelists here today. Uh, thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with us. That was very helpful for me, and I expect that the audience enjoyed that as much as I did. That hour really went by without noticing. I thank you again.